Hello, hello everyone. We are back. This is the Northern Flights podcast. I'm with Jesse, obviously the co-host. It's been a while. We might be a little bit rusty. Um, super excited to get back to you guys. Uh, yeah, Jesse, how's it going? It's going. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess we can talk about how it's going, how it's been going since we talked to you guys last. Um, finishing out the season and stuff like that. As of late, I've been a bit hobbled up. I'm nursing a torn hamstring currently, so that's a little less fun. And has your big news been shared on the podcast? Because your big news is way I, bigger yeah, than mine. Yeah, I mean, that was so long ago. So part of the reason why we uh, we kind of we put the podcast on hold and we we're hoping to get a few episodes here and there. Um, my wife and I had a baby. My wife's the one that did the actual work. But um, there is a baby in our household now. You might hear her in the background. Um, our studio isn't so much a studio as it is just a basement. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she's five months old now, and things are going pretty good. So busy, busy. Not a lot of disc golf playing in my life, but it's slowly kind of feel like we're getting to this rhythm where I've been able to get a couple times. And, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. fair trade-off, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Beautiful, and there's snow on the ground baby. now, too. So, I mean, uh, yeah. Snow yeah. on the ground is one thing, but... Tell the people the truth. You had a beautiful baby. Yeah. If you're comfortable sharing her name. Yeah. Her name is Juniper Joe Lauder. Um, yeah. Super excited. You're just grinning because you're smitten. She is a, yeah. a beautiful young lady. Yeah. And uh, maybe future disc golfer too. I think she will. Um, if you check out her, uh, our, I think I posted on Instagram, we'll put a picture of her with her first disc. If not, that'll be up soon. Um, yeah. She has her, her first little mini and we made a little mini for her. So it was great. Yeah, I get such yeah. a kick out of it. Uh, I've got a friend with a almost two year old now, oh, yeah. and I brought can jam over to one of the barbecues they had, and uh, their son was trying so hard to throw the disc, <laughs> nice. but there's just no spin, but so much effort, and I it's bet. so great to yeah. see that clumsiness but ambition all kind of collide at the same time. Yeah, totally, cool. Yeah, no, I took her out with the cherry at, uh, a while ago to the radium course, which is still in pretty rough condition, and was able to get through the course and only had to do one feed throughout so it was good hopefully gonna try to do it again wow. this weekend i think so if not yeah. disc golfer uh youngest caddy maybe yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah um and as usual we do have a a couple of beers here um these ones were provided by uh, a friend of mine uh pete friend of ours pete he plays oh, a little bit of disc golf pete, every once in a man. while gave these to me yesterday um they are dark magic a hor- horcata Horchata, horchata yeah. milk stout from Neighborhood Brewing out of Penticton, BC. Cool. Super excited to uh, get one of these. I'll read the label while you do your opening. Yeah. As season changes, the days magically get shorter and the beer magically gets darker, which uh, isn't pretty true for me, actually. Yeah, it's true uh, for a lot Creamy milk stout sweetened with a touch of lactose and vanilla, then a pinch of cinnamony goodness. It's a spellbinding concoction. It's dark magic. Oh, wow. Cool. Um, very cool, but I guess um, I'll let you taste it because I'm not going to, and I will tell you a bit about that in a second. All right. It's good. It's uh, definitely a, a stout, and, you know, I've had milk stouts in the past. This one isn't as milky as they are because I'm usually not the biggest fan of milk stouts just because I find that sort of milky smoothness is not quite what i'm looking for so um but it's uh, a little more subtle in this one i find so yeah it's good thing because when i'm looking for a beer i love that stuff i think my favorite beer style i might have mentioned it before is milkshake ipa right, which is just right. dumping lactose <laughs> into a fruity ipa but uh, yeah no that sounds great um yeah i guess if we want to talk about it quickly um we'll talk about the season a bit later but my season did not end the way i wanted it to and i uh, decided to make some changes recently and yeah, I haven't been drinking for almost a month and a half, two months now. All right. Total diet change, everything. I'm down 23 pounds in the last two months. Nice. Congratulations. And yeah, hoping that'll uh, you know carry out into some good things in the season as well. Some extra practice, some weight training, and some stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, we can touch on it a bit more. No disrespect to Neighborhood Brewing because Horchata Milk Soap is kind of sounding well, like it's go. so far up my alley, but... <laughs> temptation got to stay away from yeah, it if you're going to yeah. try to make big changes right well there you go i guess we'll have to stop looking for a beer sponsor for the podcast then i've been and i don't like hot beverages and i don't drink coffee and i don't drink caffeine so i've been drinking 
I'm trying to drink like herbal tea in the morning because it's supposed to be good for your noggin or something. And it's a battle to the change. I'll yeah. take the beer over the tea any day, <laughs> but uh, for now, we're sticking to it. There you go. Cool. Well, we have some big news uh, in uh, Park Pro headquarters here. Mm-hmm. Um, the team is growing, and not just on the podcast, but also just in general. The the Park Pro team is growing. Uh, we have some new talent. Uh, both he will be on screen, on the air, and he, he'll be in the booth for for doing the uh, coverage. And he's also going to help with some editing and film work. He's basically just a, another me. Without further ado... <laughs> We are going to be bring in Matt Lysak. What's going on, guys? What's up, Matt? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, so glad to be here. Nice to see you guys. Yeah, it's great to see you again. Been a, yeah. It's been a minute now. I think, uh, yeah, PEI was the last roundup. I think so. This is uh, this is the thing about disc golf is you make all these friends. It's like summer camp, and then you don't see them all winter. Pretty then much. you get out to a tournament in the spring, and you get to see all your friends again. It's just the best. So I'm glad we're shortcutting that a little bit here. Oh, absolutely. Did you actually go to summer camp as a kid? No, I never went to summer camp. Me neither. Great analogy, but me neither. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard stories of people going to summer camp, and it just sounds like the most fun you can have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been a minute. No summer camps. How's your off season been? My off season's been great, man. You know those twenty two pounds you lost? Yeah, I found them. Hell yeah! <laughs> yeah. I yeah. worked hard for those twenty two pounds, and I'm glad you're putting them to good use. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what? I uh, I wouldn't say I take my disc golf quite as seriously as you probably, Jesse. So for me, the off season is uh, once the snow flies, I usually take a month or two off and just don't throw any discs at all. Uh, and then eventually I'll start working with the resistance bands and getting those tendons all stretched out and those muscles used to doing those pulling motions. And then I'll probably play some winter golf at some point, but, um, you know, it's uh, disc golf is my entire summer, spring, all the way through to October usually. And, um, it's nice to just step away and not do a thing and remember why you miss it after a while. So distance, that's where I'm at right does now. Make the heart grow fonder, even if it's with a plastic frisbee. That's for sure. Um, Absolutely. But I guess other than your off season, uh, you should probably get some introduction in. Because other than being a handsome man with a hat with your name on it, people might not know who you are. Um, yeah, maybe, who you are? Where? What's your home club? Where do you play? When's, when's your favorite start? What's your favorite course? What's your favorite color? All the details. Oh my goodness. Let's, All right. Well, let's start with how you got into this sport. How did you find disc golf? Where did you start? Yeah, so I live in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, and I played ultimate for about eight years, eight or nine years, something like that. And uh, as the years went on, I got older and fatter and slower and more injured. And um, eventually, I was kind of winding down my useful life as a as an active athlete. And then one of my friends said. Hey, you wouldn't have any interest in uh, trying out this disc golf thing, would you? And I said, disc golf, what's that? And I said, it's all the throwing, which was my favorite part of Ultimate, and none of the running or getting concussions. And I said, yes, of course, I would love to play that game. So uh, I went out to Rundle Park, which is, uh, you know, for a long time was sort of our only real course in the city. And uh, with a with an Ultimate lid. <laughs> and sort of chunked my way around the course and had fun. Uh, but then on the seventh hole, uh, we saw a disc up in the tree and I climbed uh, probably 20 feet up a spruce tree and found a putter, uh, a psycho. I, I can't remember which uh, Dismania model that's the psycho a was. Which yeah. one? That's a P2. So I found a P2 psycho. And then in the same tree, I found a distance driver, which I think was a sword. And, uh, and then I was like, I got to try these discs out. And, I was throwing almost entirely forehands and I could actually make the disc go pretty far. And, uh, man, it's just, once you, once you get that first taste of it, it's, uh, you get hooked real quick. So I played with those two discs for a while until I found out that you're actually supposed to call the number on the back of the disc (laughs) and give someone's discs back. Uh, at which point I had to get my own discs. And, uh, so that was in, I think 2015, 2016, somewhere around there. And um, got hooked immediately. I met uh, Wally uh, here in Edmonton, and uh, uh, he said, "Hey, you, you should play a tournament." 
And I was like, you guys have tournaments in this sport? <laughs> he said, yeah, we got lots of tournaments. Uh, you should sign up for one. You'll get addicted. And I was like, there's no way I'm getting addicted to disc golf tournaments. <sighs> <laughs> Fast forward. Tales all this time, that one. Hey. Yeah. Then I got addicted to disc golf tournaments. So yeah. uh, I've been playing in tournaments since uh, 2017 and uh, I've been on both coasts and uh, even did a couple of tours through the U.S. Just a couple of disc golf trips with my friends. And uh, yeah, it's my it's my life now. Yeah, cool. I was going to cut you off, but you powered through me like the strong guy that you are. Because I like to give these community people a bit of a shout out every time their names come up. We've been talking about Carrie, Neil, and some other people like that. But Wally is kind of was and is the man in that area. Like, I'm sure your era and before, Wally was probably the only guy you could buy a disc from, like n- north of Calgary or something like that, from whoever, whatever time he started through until more uh, recent guys popped up and also kind of the driving force behind a lot of those tournaments like uh, oh the River City Cup I always get yeah. <laughs> that mixed up with Lethbridge because they're called the Bridge City Gunners River City Bridge I don't know anyway yeah, yeah. shout out to yeah. Wally yeah Wally Wally yeah he would uh, sell discs out of the back of his car uh, and uh, I think he's TD'd uh, 100 tournaments or something like that <laughs> Um, or he's just about to TD his 100th, but he's uh, finally kind of trying to pass the reins off to some other people, but he did a ton. Yeah, he's definitely one of those uh, pioneers that did a ton for the sport out here. So got me into playing tournaments, and my life changed because of it. So mm-hmm. Absolutely. So yeah. what was the first tournament you ended up playing? <laughs> I played in the uh, Night Owl, which was held at Rundle Park, and it was a four-round tournament which I love, and I thought that was sort of the norm, and uh, I wouldn't be sad if we went back to it, but um, we played an M2, and uh, in my very first round, my very first tournament, I hit, a, I hit an ace on a, on a blind par three, wow. and I was the only ace that weekend, so I got the entire ace pot, which was like 350 bucks or something like that. That's uh, yeah. And I was like, this, this disc golf stuff is easy. <laughs> this is great. I'm going to keep doing this. I think I haven't had an A since. Good experience for that first one, right? That's the like little bit that you keep coming back for. But anyway. So yeah. And uh, like some of the people that I played with on my cards are still some of my best disc golf friends uh, that I have now uh, from all over the province. So yeah, it was just a fantastic uh, experience. Loved it. And that was in 2015, you said? Uh, 2017. 20, oh, you found the game in 2015. Yeah. And then, yes, first tournament in 2017. So still, like, uh, well ahead of the COVID bubble of people. I got that. I uh, just got in under the wire with that five-digit PDJ number. <laughs> nice, so. nice, nice. Yeah, and I always bring that stuff up because it feels like, for me, that 2017 is yesterday. But, dog, you've been playing disc golf tournaments for half a decade. Yeah. This is going by fast. Yeah. My rating went up at least 60 points. <laughs> <laughs> I think mine went up at least 16 points. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, now, obviously, you've been playing tournaments for a long time. I see you pretty much everywhere in our area. Um, highlights, lowlights from that time, from that first tournament to now. Yeah, you know, going out to PEI... Um, especially in 2018, the first time I'd ever been out to the Maritimes, um, and just, and playing those courses and, and getting to meet people from across the country was just an awesome experience. Like you get to know the people in your region. Um, you know, you play a lot of tournaments around Alberta and BC and you get to know, you know, a lot of the people there, but, you know, going to nationals was like, you're on a card with a guy from Quebec and someone from Saskatchewan and, um, someone from Halifax and it's, you just get to find out that everybody across the country is kind of the same if they're into disc golf. Just as nuts as you are. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's one of those things where it doesn't really matter where you're from. It's, we all have disc golf in common and that's, and that's enough. And, um, but yeah, if, uh, if you haven't been out to the Maritimes, especially to play disc golf out in PEI, highly recommend it it is paradise out there and it is disc golf paradise out there so that would probably be the highlight and getting to see some you know big name pros play in person um you know getting to watch nate sexton throw a forehand is 
something you just sort of have to experience in person watching simon lazat throw in person the disc sounds like it's being it's it sounds like a jet engine being shot out of his hand um yeah it was that was a fantastic experience yeah cool. obviously one of my favorite spots too we got to get you out there yeah i know we tried Next to scheme year. it this year and with the Dismania open coming up might be the i wouldn't say that i'm gonna say it might be the best time ever to go to pei mm. but i kind of say these tournaments are kind of like watching bands you saw your favorite band in a pub size atmosphere before they got big and you didn't have to sit 400 rows away maybe it's best then maybe it's best when there's more money in the production value but mm -hmm. No matter how it goes, uh, the courses, the people that run it, uh, it's going to be a banger this year again for sure. Yeah, and it's just going to keep getting better and better. You know, as as the um, for those for our listeners that don't know, um, the Dismania Open is is being held at the same place where Nationals is. Our uh, Nationals was last year, and it is now a silver event on the Pro Tour. Mm -hmm. So, um, and who knows how far that will go? You know, you, you start out as a silver event, and then you know you could be uh, on the regular pro tour so like an elite event eventually you know they definitely the courses definitely uh are are to that level so absolutely um, yeah definitely get to that point um and so yeah this would be probably a, a good good time to go and you know there's going to be at least a few of the the touring pros down from south that are going to come up to play well, so. i think there's quite a few confirmed already and yeah. i don't know enough to say anything for certain but i do know that the only other event that disc mania puts its name on is european open right and this is the only tour stop with a disc mania name on it yeah. in north america not going to say we're having european open level next year but uh disc mania takes their stuff very seriously yeah as we might have seen today in that video yes <laughs> now, did you watch the uh, stratosphere video for the new mystery box no, I haven't seen it yet, but I might have ordered a mystery box anyway. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm pretty sure UC sent a mystery box into space on a hot air balloon of some kind or something. Yeah. Yeah, there might have been some jets and some helicopters and some. They, they take yeah. it pretty serious. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess uh, that was a, a little bit of a preview of the Dismania Open. And, and obviously, as we get in the off season, we're going to kind of talk about tournaments like that and some of the bigger tournaments that are coming up next year and kind of preview them a little bit uh especially from the point of view from park pro because you know our, our goal is to get to as many tournaments as we can this year and that's part of why matt's joined the team um he's been awesome we've been have a lot had a lot of good back and forth and trying to decide what's possible and what we can do so uh if you have a tournament in your hometown and you want to see park pro do some some coverage of it then definitely uh reach out to your tournament director and reach out to us and hopefully we can get out to some of these bigger tournaments across the country so and uh yeah just back to you matt uh on that note uh why have you decided to take this sort of uh i'm not going to say a turn in your career but uh why have you sort of tried to steer your your dirt your focus to the media side of disc golf i can't throw a disc very well andre i what? you know <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I was a kid, uh, I refereed uh, soccer and basketball, and I was at a basketball referee training event. And uh, I remember the the trainer said, you know why most people get into refing? And we we're all like, I don't know, like, you like rules? <laughs> you like giving back? And he said, no. Mostly we're either too short or we can't shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so part of it's that for me, too. Um, I love disc golf and you know disc golf is is definitely has been growing thanks to digital media primarily uh especially in the you know the last five to ten years and um you know i was when i was a kid i, I always wanted to be on tsn you know sports desk um i just love i just love that part of it and being able to tell stories and uh you know bring the sport to people that you know, either can't get there in person or haven't really experienced it too much. And um, with the technology we have, we can do that. So um, I'm really excited to create a, a beautiful, um, you know, technically sound production 
uh, to, of the sport that uh, that we all love. And um, yeah, and you only live once. Cool. Uh, and just yeah. kind of on that note, uh, what do you think the uh, media and the, the growth of media and content, what, do you, what do you, effect do you think that's going to have on Canadian disc golf specifically? Is that something that you see going a long way? And uh, yeah, growing over the coming years? I think so. You know, going to tournaments, it definitely has a community feel to it. Even the biggest tournaments, like even going out to nationals and PEI this year, which I think we had 450 players at nationals this year or something like that. And it still feels very much like a community thing and like this, uh, you know, secret that we all kind of maybe talk about with our coworkers in hushed tones. And I think the sport is getting to a place where, you know, if TSN isn't showing disc golf, then TSN is going to go out of business because they better be showing disc golf. And I want to be part of that growth and, and getting it to that point where, you know, people who maybe don't even play the sport uh, watch it as a spectator because it is super entertaining to watch, even if you're not out there throwing discs and you don't know, you know, what a flight rating is on a disc that uh, is just as compelling as, as any other sport out there. So. I think it's, uh, I mean, people watch cornhole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a professional cornhole league. This golf is at least as good as, as cornhole. At least. As a spectator sport. Yeah. No, I think you're onto something there. Because there's a million, a million. In Canada, there's at least 30 million people watching sports that they don't play, probably. You know? But F1 drivers, so uh, I believe there's there's two in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And there's millions of people that watch that. Yeah. Two sports? Stick ball and stick puck. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, the, the sports that we're watching on TV, they're so established that they're part of kind of like our common knowledge as much as crossing the street or driving a car is. And I think disc golf, even mm-hmm. like a visual standpoint and the suspense and all the excitement that you would get from any other sport is there for disc golf. This hasn't reached that common knowledge point yet. And to the media point, the more media you put out there, the more people get exposed to it, the quicker we get to that place. And I, yeah, so I think that project, this project, are really important for the sport. Yeah. It's all about, uh, I mean, you hate to use the, I don't know if it's, is it a cliche at this point, the growing the sport. But I mean, I feel like things like this is, it's crucial um, for, for that kind of stuff is just getting more media and more eyes. Not just like eyes from the disc golf world, like, for example, my my brothers, they're hooked now. Um, that's also a new development. Five months ago when we last had our podcast, I think they'd thrown maybe like two or three rounds collectively kind of thing. And now they're, my brother post, he shared a post with me that he had uh, 30 rounds in 30 days last wow. month or two months ago. So um, just having stuff like that. And, and then like he's, he's listening to podcasts, he's watching some video. And, you know, I think stuff like that is just huge. So, yeah. And once you get the bug in this game, it's hard to shake it. That's for sure. Yeah. And just, I think the internet and digital media, um, you know, for a long time, we would watch hockey, football, you know, baseball, basketball. That was about it. But there was only, you know, one or two sports channels on TV. And now that you can have an infinite number of channels, I think people are discovering that there is a market for a ton of different sports. Uh, and the only reason they're not on TV is because they haven't been on TV previously. But um, with the internet now, like you can find every single set of eyeballs that might have interest in disc golf. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think it's that TV is dying to streaming anyway. So no longer do you have to spend $125 for the sports package for your satellite, whatever. You give the uh, Disc Golf Pro Tour their whatever the cost is, 10 bucks a month, I think is what it is with the PDGA discount. And you've got all the Disc Golf content for the entire year. Yeah, you don't great. get the Croquet Channel bundled in with it. And you can, you know, there's no, the barriers are lesser now. You get what you want. It's right there in front of you. Cost is lower. Production's higher than ever. It's it's a good place. For yeah, it. and it's uh, I mean, just on the whole disc golf network that you mentioned, it's um, even in the off season, there's content to watch. Uh, they have the the on tour series, which has been pretty good so far. Especially if you're like I, I've, I've tried, I've showed it to my wife, and now 
we watch it on Mondays. So yeah. <laughs> uh, she's, she's she's been a big fan of that. And she's for anyone that has listened to the podcast or knows me and my wife, she's not really into disc golf. So that's pretty big. It's a big step for uh, hopefully maybe if Kelsey starts. Sport. If Kelsey starts to like disc golf. Do we get to do this upstairs? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Let's get out of the basement, boys. Yeah. 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 Leveling up. up. <laughs> Literally leveling up. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, <clears throat> people watch golf or ball golf as we call it. This golf is inherently more interesting and aesthetically pleasing than than traditional golf. The ball, you hit a ball and it goes straight or it goes kind of left or it goes kind of right. It only goes in one direction. <laughs> And the disc goes in two directions. That's twice as good. That's twice as much entertainment. Yeah, there's like a f- not famous, but should be uh, like Simon Lazat quote. It might have been in one of his vlogs. It might have been like an Instagram clip. But he says, if you look at any other sport in the world, our equipment is simple, but it's actually so much more versatile based on how it interfaces with our body. We're creating different shapes and having more possible outcomes than anything like you can put a bunch of spin on a golf ball if you want and it'll curve make a curve back for me Hmm. not gonna happen right throw your disc in the air so it goes left but then turns right and turns right so much that it rolls but it rolls left after turning right we can do so much more with our equipment than most other sports that it really does have the potential to be so much more exciting in my opinion yeah because of those possibilities than what anybody else is offering all optimism on my end for sure. Yeah, if you can if you can find a way to translate that that idea of this is my favorite thing about disc golf is visualizing your disc going through three dimensional space and then making that happen and then seeing that through. And if you can translate that over video, uh, I think that's just magic. Yeah, absolutely. Even like the the double G drone chase videos they're making and stuff. If you can find a way to make that tasteful and add it into coverage and have a drone pilot that's good enough to get through trees and obstacles on like a woods course, that's like my high level now that I'm waiting for. If you can have a maple hill zigzagging through the trees kind of shot with a drone pilot that stays on that disc so you can see every last turn and you don't lose it through the trees from the guy doing the catch cam kind of thing, that that's leveled up the whole game for almost every sport, really. Yeah, totally. Or you're taking notes, right, Andre? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I guess uh, we can move on from here. It's uh, great to meet Matt. I'm sure our listeners are looking forward to hearing more from you in the, the coming weeks and years and whatnot for as long as we're doing this. So um, very exciting stuff. Uh, Park Pro is officially leveling up. So that's always awesome. You know, when, you're, when your team's growing, that's a good thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, before we get any further, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention Disc Golf Park. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the show. I get to monologue about Disc Golf Park. <laughs> so shout out to Disc Golf Park for the support of our podcast. They are a supplier of disc golf course equipment, baskets, tee pads, and signs. They have taken a great liking to what we're doing in here in Canada. There are sales reps everywhere. If you are in our Rocky Mountain area, you can hit up Matt Reardon. And he will get you sorted out with any information you need on disc golf park baskets, tee pads, or signs. Like I said, I personally have used disc golf park baskets on my last two projects. They are a great build quality. They're built in Europe. None of this China stuff going on. And they look great with those blue bands. They catch great. And they've got that fancy arrow welded into the basket. So it makes course navigation so much easier for new players. Can't I can't mean, say enough good stuff. You're kind of saving money on the next tee signs because you don't really need need them because they're right there on the basket absolutely the bottom of the basket you pick your disc up out of the basket and you know where to go so that's exciting and there are a couple i think matt's got a couple of projects in the area we've mentioned them before there's the one that's going on in parsons there mm-hmm. um hopefully in the spring i believe that'll be shorter playable yeah it's uh, again sort of playable in like a prototyping phase right now i have played one of the loops myself um, I know they've got the other nine in because this will be a 27 hole course on a very cool property. It's essentially into the side of a mountain. Uh, and there's some cool like over these big gully shots where your disc can be going down a couple hundred feet. 
know that sounds scary, but they have built safe ways to get down and retaining walls to catch your discs and stuff like that. So it's not too crazy. But yeah, spectacular property. Very cool course. He's got some other stuff going on in Alberta for a couple as well. I'm not sure how public those are, so I will keep my lips sealed for now. Yeah. But yeah. But you'll hear it here, here first, probably. <laughs> yeah. You will hear it here first. I guarantee it. Cool. All right, guys, you guys want to get into sort of uh, what we kind of thought we would do for this first episode as we were just kind of, uh, you know, getting back into the swing of things as we just kind of go through the top five of the Canadian pros in the MPO and FPO divisions and just kind of break down, you know, their seasons or any notable tournaments that they won or, yeah, just go over how they did. So why don't we start off with the... MPO here we have Thomas Gilbert in first we're of course we're sorting by rating here so um Thomas Gilbert and Kim Scott Wood are both rated 1025 Casey Hannemeyer 1013 Chris Oslins Ozel Oslins Oslins Oz Oz just Chris Oz 1012 and Martin Hendel 10 or 1011 so uh yeah any notables mm. on on those guys how their seasons went uh this is going to be tough for me to remember because um, we'll talk about it later, maybe. I tried to push a lot of last season out of my brain. But we talked to Thomas Gilbert early in the year. He had a great start of the season in Florida. Um, and then, you know, some top 10s at DGPT early on. We're talking... and uh, Let's look. We have the list in front of us, so I can at least tell you that. I know he played well at Waco in the Memorial early on. Uh, he kind of hovered around the mid cash point for a while after that. Um, but again, a top 10 at Jonesboro, which is huge fourth at throw down the mountain, which isn't a pro tour stop, but is a very, very popular A tier that a lot of people go down to. Um, of course see. he won the T tournament capital open shout the, out tournament capital, the tournament capital open. If you haven't watched the TCO coverage, check it out at parkpro.com, uh, YouTube dot com slash park pro uh check out that coverage it's uh we're very very proud of it and we're excited to get more out to you guys so i gotta yeah, hit that subscribe button like, hit the subscribe, comment, subscribe button. hit that bell uh mm -hmm. i think so after the right, we did the coverage i got uh a message from duncan saying thank you for making it sound like i'm actually good at disc golf <laughs> chances duncan listens to this pretty slim but duncan you are good at disc golf buddy yeah, quick shout out to Duncan, who wasn't too far off of the list here. He is sitting in, what's that, eighth eighth place in Canada. So, uh, yeah, yeah not doing though. too bad. Yeah, that's a first slip under 1,000 for Duncan for a while, for a while I think. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that was Tommy G's season. Yeah. Round of yeah. Guys, 40 tournaments. Is what Thomas played? Thomas played. Thomas Gilbert played 40 tournaments, 4-0 tournaments. Well, his season started like next week kind of thing based on how long he's playing <laughs> in this out there um yeah. let's look yeah he started a season january the 28th and is still playing events i believe yes he yeah. just played his last tournament on the eighth <laughs> last weekend last, November, <laughs> last weekend so he might be going for a perfect 52 for 52 but who knows and oh yeah anyone canadian nationals how did we not mention that oh yeah that too yeah. i was uh caddying for casey while Thomas was getting his trophy. Thomas cool. had some fun late in that round. I guess I can recap a bit of that. Matt, I think you were watching with us at the time? I only caught the, the front nine of that final round. Oh, okay, so. so in the back nine, uh, Thomas had a pretty commanding lead and started trying to throw like 600 foot over the top shots on skinny tunnel holes just because he could. I think at one point he was like at least 60 feet into rough with trees spaced like six inches apart and he had to do like a double triple forehand roller just to get back to the fairway <laughs> love that he put on a show ran like the hillcrest hole 17 death putt from 100 feet all the way down the hill and like yeah it was fun to watch him for sure yeah. cool yeah his cash total for the year so far is twenty four thousand hundred ninety six dollars so that's not too shabby yeah that's a labor job in arkansas yeah We'll move down the list. Kim Scott Wood. I don't know if how many term tournaments he really plays. Uh, he played one. Probably <laughs> just to get his name on the board. So I don't know him at all, but I do know that he's been around the game forever. 
he is one of the established pro guys. I got a feeling he probably spent some time trying to tour earlier on in his career. Um, Toronto guy, one of those guys that would be playing against Thomas, Marty, and, you know, the usual suspects down there. Yeah. Uh, looks like he took home the Toronto Island A tier this year. Yeah, exactly. Took uh, took down Martin Hendel and Cam Zanini. Uh, he had uh, pretty, pretty some pretty good ratings on his rounds there, and that's probably why he's up there in the ratings. He's 1,016 for first round, 1041, 1033. So well, that'll uh, that'll do it. And uh, Martin Hendel is pretty pretty good. So beat him is pretty good. Yeah, Martin, would you say he's third on your list here now? Yeah, uh, I believe so, yeah. I didn't keep up with much, but I know Marty had a really good run at Masters Worlds. Yeah. Uh, Northwoods Black, I believe he ended up getting second. He came in second, yeah. 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 Martin's fifth, fifth uh, in for the rating, but we can jump to him I'm right skipping away. around. Yeah, that's all right. We can jump to him um, just because we're already on on that. So, yeah, he uh, he started off in the Disc Golf Pro Tour Championship. So, or sorry, the um, what are we here? Champions Cup. No, you got the dates. I got the dates mangled. all mang- mangled there. Vegas. He started in Vegas. That's what it was. And a bad showing in Vegas for him, actually. 64th place. But... Uh, not necessarily something I would put to his strong suits. Uh, yeah. He throws a little bit flippier discs and stuff, and that's a very open course that can be susceptible to some wind. So I don't like to say not surprising, but not terribly surprising. Um, he did podium like five A-tiers this year, including a win in Eddieville, and a second place at, yeah, the Masters Worlds in MP40. That was at Northwoods Black, and that's a serious course. There is not a lot of room for error. Yeah. And... He beat Michael Johansson, Steve Rico, Dave Feldberg, Steve Brinster. Yeah. Like you know, serious, you know, serious names in that Masters division right you know. now. You're not knowing any <laughs> no, of those just guys? kidding. Get out of here. <laughs> but you might be new enough not to know like Steve Brinster yeah. or somebody like that. But good Lord, yeah. No, it's a really serious field. And did he lose in a playoff or did he lose in the final round? Because he lost by only one stroke, if I'm remembering correctly. <clears throat> it looks like the final, there was a final nine. Hmm. And, and he, he missed won. out by one over Joe Revere in the final he in the final nine stroke in the final final nine. Yeah, tough bounce, but uh, you know, second place on a field like that is pretty serious, no matter who you ask. So, good job, Marty. Yeah. Uh, talk about him forever because he's a great guy to play with. I played on a card with him at the Ontario Provincials a couple of years ago, and we're gonna get to. Oh, let's leave Casey for last. Yeah, we'll leave Casey for last. We'll go Chris Oz. Uh, I didn't pay attention to anything Oz did. He is a staple of Southern Ontario, plays yeah. for Thought Space Athletics. And we played kind of, 14 tournaments last year. And I kind of talked smack about Marty for getting 64th at Vegas, but uh, Oz got 91st. So, yeah, Marty, you're the greatest. Nice to see him get <laughs> down, to, down to some of these elite series. Oh, events, absolutely. Just uh, showing up and like getting the experience on a bigger stage. Yeah, Chris isn't a spring chicken. He'd have to be kind of in his mid thirties if I had to guess. But I don't think he's got a lot of time playing big tour events in the states. So uh, good for him. Uh, otherwise, I think he kind of dominated the uh, Southern Ontario scene. With mm, oh boy, not a lot of big tier wins other than oh Boxwood, Boxwood, yeah. and the Knock. Yeah, but uh, he did get seven first place finishes though, so that's not bad. Yeah. Two second places and a third. Oh, more than not bad. That's still a fantastic season, by especially by Canadian standards. Um, Northern Ontario Championships, by the way. I know he had a part in organizing it. Uh, that is the tournament that's becoming Nationals now that's leaving PEI. So Nationals will be in Thunder Bay at Dragon Hills. And I can't remember the other course, but uh, definitely check that out. So value bet for your uh, Canadian uh, uh, disc golf pool. <laughs> yeah. Yes. For, for everyone that does the Canadian disc golf pool. For uh, the only you that ever did a Canadian disc golf pool. <laughs> yeah. But actually, I've got some secret news from the guys over at Skip Ace, which is Smashbox. They are adding a bunch of features to the Skip Ace Fantasy Disc Golf coming next year. So if you are a fantasy sports guy for football or something like that and found that doing Skip Ace was a little bit bare bones and, you know, 
not at the level you're used to, they are also leveling up the skip base fantasy disc golf this year. Yeah. Shout out to Smashbox. Totally. Uh, I'd say they're probably on an equal level podcast to us somewhere around there. <laughs> we are They'll get there one day. Harder than Johnny, but all three of us have better beards, including me. <laughs> I'm like the wish.com Terry Miller is what they call me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What does that make us? Uh, the good looking ones. <laughs> <laughs> Rip Terry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, moving on to our friend and yours, Casey Hanemeyer, the local boy. Had a pretty good season out here, as far as I know. Maybe uh, not the best on tour. He did have his big debut on the full pro tour for the first half of the season before coming home. Um, I know from talking to him that he showed up couple days before DDO in Kansas, landed in a rainstorm that he thought would wash his car away and quickly had second thoughts about Kansas. Uh, I know he had enough second thoughts that after playing DDO, he actually dropped out of Worlds because he didn't want to go back. <laughs> yeah. But that was the DDO where it was like, you know, uh, everywhere. Wizard of Oz tornado wins, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Uh, the second tournament he played, though, uh, that's when he qualified for USDGC. He didn't go down this year, mm-hmm. but he did qualify. So um, and he finished sixth at the uh, the 303 Open. Yeah, yeah, uh, over in Colorado there. Um, I, he beat a lot of great players there, too, actually. I know some guys yeah. got him, but I think he bested Nathan Queen, who was coming off a Champions Cup win the year prior and stuff like that. Um, so I thought that would be a big confidence booster for him. Mm. But again, not a lot of tour experience and kind of hovered around the cash line a lot. Unfortunately, mostly south of that cash line, I think. But yeah. we got to see the world, the world, world south of us anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and shout out to his finish at the tournament TCO as well. So you'll see him on coverage there as well. So um, definitely worth checking out. Looks like he had a rough start, and then once he got back into Canada, he just kind of turned it on again and um, took down a bunch of tournaments. So Yeah, uncharacteristic fourth at River City Cup, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tournament wins after June 15th. So that's a pretty serious second half to the season and podiuming, podiuming almost everything else. So shout out. I mean, Cash did the Beaver State play. Yeah. Uh, pretty classic track. That's a if you're gonna do well at a tournament, Beaver State Fling is a got to be a pretty memorable one to cash at. I would imagine. Absolutely, and from my own talkings with him, I know that he seemed to like that Northwest swing, the style of golf they're playing up there. Beaver State Fling, Portland Open were big highlights for him, as far as I remember. Um, maybe not such a fan of the flatlands in between, but uh, yeah, definitely said bucket list getting out there, and playing the fling. Uh, and definitely has suggested that I get off my butt and try and do it too. And I intend to. It's, uh, I got to the chance to play at Milo and it is like going to Augusta. It's cool. like you get into the park and you just sort of feel like you're on hallowed grounds out there <laughs> and you can go to the hole that Philo Albatross and you can, you know, try and replicate it. And then you get a sense for just how impossible that is. And just the, the park is unbelievable and playing disc golf there is it's, it's incredible. I highly recommend it. Yeah. yeah. Actually, funny you bring that up because did you see that at the fort they put a little plaque in for where James threw in from? Not just a plaque, yeah. a tee pad. Well, yeah, a tee pad. Practically a plaque, though. It's, so it, it's a memorable kind of spot to memorialize what he did. But it'd be kind of cool if they did that for the Philo second shot. So you could oh, sit yeah. there and try it because it tells you exactly where it was and it shows you exactly what you need to do to be on that level. And I think it would humble a lot of people real quick. Yeah, yeah. we had to load up the video <laughs> on our phones and yeah, like so triangulate it out on the course. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. We had the same thought when we were out there. Like, just give me, give me a plaque to throw from. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to the FPO side of things. Uh, Christy Lee and Colleen McGuinz. McGinnis. McGinnis. McGuinz. Rude. I'm... Um, real bad with these names if you haven't <laughs> been able to tell already you mess up the next one i'm calling the police yeah we her. <laughs> uh they're both rated at 921 and then julie bones is 915 sandy hendel 
9-11 and rounding out our top five is Laura Smith, 909. Quick shout out though to Chantel Budinski, who just misses out on this 906. She just got her first A tier win down south, I think a couple weeks ago. So wow. um hopefully we can get her on the podcast here sometime to sometime soon to talk about that. But uh yeah. absolutely and she's Miss Frisbee on, on Instagram, YouTube yeah. Instagram, I think. Yeah. Makes a lot of content out there. Yeah. Cool. Um, and Christy Lee, I believe she had a she had a pretty good season. Um, she only she played nine tournaments, and she finished first in all but two of them. <laughs> so, um, and that obviously uh, that uh, the one of those tournaments was the WIFDIF World Team Disc Golf Championships, um, where Canada finished third so she was a part of that team that went over to croatia yeah and i think um it was actually colleen mckinnis that secured the third place in a playoff against oh, Finland, yeah, right. if i remember right yeah so a lot of these women were involved in that christy lee obviously being a huge staple of women's disc golf in western canada she is taking home the hardware everywhere she goes team cast a plus member yeah totally well and i guess since we've talked about them too casey hannemeyer and duncan schultz Schultz, uh, also both being on that WIFDIF team. Yeah, they were, yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of big tournaments here. A couple, uh, three A-tier wins, and um, that's uh, nothing to slouch at. So, yeah. Yeah, winning Falcons Flight, BC Open, and TCO is kind of the big triple crown of Western Canadian tournaments. So, yeah. hard to do it any better. Yeah. It was... Uh, I was luckily lucky enough to watch two of those wins. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, she's a great player. Very consistent. That's cool to see. Cool. Next on your list. Next on the list we have Colleen McKinnis. McKinnis. I've almost said the kinds again. <laughs> Colleen McKinnis. I, I don't know much about her. Um but uh, she also took a number of first place. Uh, first places and including uh, three A tiers as well. So, um, yeah, one of the bigger names in Ontario for sure. I think she battles it out with uh, Sandy and I guess Chantel now most of the time. Um, yeah, she's a great thrower and a good ambassador for the sport. I know she's been involved with us at Top Link in the past, and uh, yeah, the few experiences I've had around her, either as a, an official on a course, has always been. Super awesome, and her shots are great. She throws pretty hard when she wants to, and I know she, like we said, she won that playoff for the whiff diff, uh third place, but I'm pretty sure she piped like a 300 to 350 foot like tunnel shot and put it leaning on the post for a tap in for the win. So that highlight, I believe, is online. Maybe not on YouTube or something, but if you have the Facebook of anyone that was at that tournament, it was all over it. And I thought that was pretty cool. Otherwise, looking at the tournaments that she won, Foxwood obviously being kind of the big one along with, wow, uh, the uh, Toronto Island Maple Leaf. Uh, she also won provincial championships, but those are a B tier this year and not on as big a course as they usually are. Um, and the Christy Lake Spring Fling as well, which is a B tier. Um, but I saw it on the A tier list for next year. So that one should be getting a little level up. As far as I know, it kind of bounces back and forth between A tier yeah. and B tier over the years. Yeah. And uh, she did get down south for one disc golf pro tour event, and she finished 29th there at the Great Lakes Open. So I mean, she picked a good one to go to. D Glow is probably yeah. one of the tournaments I'd like to play yeah. for sure. Michigan Summer's also pretty nice. Mm. And it looks like she also uh, uh, went down to the River City Open, uh, which I believe is also in Michigan, placed ninth and was not far from some big name touring pros uh, in the FTO division at that. So, wow. knocking on the door. Knocking on the door. And Sandy Handel, Marty's sister, the dream team, those two, she did quite well as well she looks like she only played all a tiers except for two c tiers and she won how many of them andre is that six two three four five six yeah that's right six a tier wins two second place finish finishes oh one of them is a c tier but yeah 
That's uh, that's pretty big. And then she also played in a couple of uh, eight tiers in the uh, Masters Women's Division as well, placing first at the Memorial Championship, um, which is, uh, you know, that's a big tournament. So um, no kidding. And when you're playing against the Americans and stuff, uh, I don't typically expect us Canadians to be super crusher power throwers compared to them. But the Memorial, and well, it looks like second in Vegas as, as well. Yeah. Those are throwers' courses. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And she killed it. Against, you know, fields that are competitive with her, players that are rated higher than her. It's not like she bumped up into 40-plus after playing FPO and just, you know, had a free ride by any means. Especially uh, the... Um, you're looking at MP60. I'm trying. You gotta go north. You gotta go north. You gotta go. Eleventh at Masters Worlds is pretty good too. Yes. Uh, we were trying to get what she did sorted out down at the Las Vegas Challenge, and it looks like she finished exactly in line. Did everyone play and score to their rating? No, there's one person out of order, but they pretty much placed their ratings, which is kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, playing well down there, especially compared to our other Canadian counterparts who we talked about struggling. And Laura Smith, who Laura Smith, I don't know, I don't know Laura as well either. So she's from Waterloo. We're gonna do some on podcast. She research. only played one tournament. Uh, <clears throat> in two thousand and four. Two thousand and four. So wait a minute, uh, is she active? But I I she's know current, no, so. I know Laura Smith. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> Go back. <laughs> Click on her 1998 and tell me if there's Am Worlds on there. Yes. 1998 PDJ Amateur Disc Golf World Championships and Junior Girls 2. <laughs> there you go. So, I don't know. Don't ask how I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you how I knew this was going to happen. Uh, I recently bought a disc from Jeff Malton, who some, most of you probably don't know. But Jeff Malton is the guy that is the model or the PDJ logo. He he is the guy making the putt on your That is Jeff Malton. That's Jeff. Um, I think he plays MP60 now. He's been around forever. Um, but he knew Laura Smith. And I was buying some discs from him. He had some old Millennium. Matt and I, we, we know we like the Millennium. And I bought a Polaris from him. And I said, this looks like a really old run. And he's like, yes, it is a really old run. This belongs or used to belong to the 1998 Junior Girls Am World Champion. How do you have this? I have the disc at home. It has Laura Smith signed on the back with her PDJ number. And Unreal. from talking to Jeff in person <laughs> this year, he said that she hadn't played for like 15 years. More than that, based on what we're seeing. She had recently refound disc golf. And if you look, her PDJ is set as current in 2022. So she just re-upped her membership for the first time in 18 years. And let's go, Laura Smith. Yes. Her, her PDJ number is 12648. Yeah. So, yeah. And she's, uh, yeah, that's a uh, very, very cool. Um, so hopefully let's get her on the podcast. Yeah, exactly. Is her phone number on the disc? <laughs> Dude, I think there is. <laughs> I got a feeling it's probably going to get her mom's landline or something like that, uh, based on how old it is and what we're seeing here. But here we, we should go. make like a. Should we make like a, a. I don't know how old Junior Girls Two is because of how the old divisions used to work. Yeah. Should we make like a podcast bet on how old Laura Smith is now. She just turned 41. Because you know when Junior Girls 2 is? No, I have no idea. <laughs> All right, take it. Under 18. For sure she was a kid, right? Yeah. Junior Girls 2. I bet she would have been 15 at that time, so. If you do math like you do names, this isn't going to help you, so just say a number. <laughs> uh, I'm going to guess she's 34. Yeah, I'll split the difference, 37. We'll find this out on the next All episode. Right, there we go. Cool, and that rounds out our top five. I guess Laura doesn't quite count, having not played a tournament in 18 years. Yeah, that bumps Chantel back up into there. So, hey, no, don't disrespect hey, my girl Laura. You, no. 
<laughs> you just said she's active, so it counts. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we're we'll counting. It's current. <laughs> it's current. It's current. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Another value pick for your Canadian skip ace right. yes, league. That would be so funny if we did Canadian only skip ace. Yeah. You got to choose from yeah. eight people, and your team consisted of two MPO and one FPO. You had to straight trade everything. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think that's uh, probably about it for the, the podcast today, but um, we just wanted to, yeah, uh, welcome you to the show, Matt. Welcome you to the team. Welcome back, Jesse. Great um, to be here. Hopefully, we'll get these out to you more often. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good to be back, and hopefully, we didn't lose any listeners. So, yeah. Thank you to our sponsor. Patrons on Patreon. Patrons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Patrons. <laughs> Um, actually, it's kind of cool. I got to meet uh, Greg Hearn, who was uh, probably the first patron uh, on our uh, on our show. So, and I met him at uh, Falcons fight last year. So, that was pretty sweet. Um, definitely worth signing up if you want to support this and this podcast and and our coverage. So, I mean, you know, a little bit goes a long way. So, very grateful for that. Absolutely. You, hey, if you watch this in video format, you saw that our camera kick the bucket in the first 10 minutes so uh you can support for as little as a dollar per piece of content i believe dollar 50 per podcast episode so if everybody that listened to this signs up everybody they know and at least that level we can afford a new memory card i don't know for the camera we can afford a software engineer (laughs) Uh, yeah uh yeah cool so uh yeah definitely and go back and check out the tco coverage and check your check up disc golf scene for upcoming tournaments for next year it's definitely kind of start time to start planning for next year so i think things are kind of starting to settle into dates and whatnot so i'm sure you'll see more and more come up on social media and stuff so follow us on instagram at park pro uh yeah cool thanks for coming on guys Guys, Matt, great to see you. Matt, do the outro. This is fun. I'm I'm super excited. I don't know what the outro is. Do we have a make do we have a tradition? Time. He just makes it out. All right. Well, from all of us here at Park Pro, we just want to wish you a, a great you know American Thanksgiving. American Thanksgiving. <laughs> Keep on doing. <laughs>